webinar is the first part of the lecture covering, covering propulsion and mixing of food in the elementary tract. It corresponds to chapter 63 in your textbook. This first part uh, webinar is going to cover the different types of mixing movements and propulsion uh, movements that we get in the oral cavity, the esophagus, and the stomach. The second part will cover what you see in the small intestine as well as the large intestine. One of the things that we're going to be discussing during class time is whether or not chiropractic, is it good for just musculoskeletal problems or can it be used to help people with somatovisceral issues. So we will go cover a particular case study in class. So that's something that you can look forward to. What we're going to do first is discuss the various mixing movements, the propulsive type movements that we have in the oral cavity, such as mastication and swallowing. A fancy term for swallowing is deglutition. We're then going to move to the esophagus and cover the process of swallowing and peristalsis. And in the stomach, we're going to cover a, a particular process called retropulsion and things that will influence the emptying of the stomach into the small intestine. So we're going to start up in the oral cavity with the process of mastication. So if you look at the comic strip, one cow is telling the other cow, chew! Well, why is it so important to chew? Well, if you don't chew, I mean, if you're not going to see what you see with this cow, but it will be very difficult to swallow. That would be one thing. It's like if you don't chew properly, it's going to make it very difficult to swallow. But the whole purpose of chewing is to break up the food particles. And which does make it easier to swallow, but it also increases surface area for digestion. Chewing is mastication. It is pretty much your first step in digestion. It's that process in which your teeth are used to crush and grind up the food. Some animal species chew a lot longer, and they're actually the reason why they chew a lot longer, like these, like, like cows do is they actually obtain more nutrients by doing that. Most of us don't chew very well, but we just chew long enough to get it down the esophagus. Now, chewing does involve knowledge of anatomy, and you've already covered this, so you should be like, I know exactly what's involved or what muscles are involved, what nerves involved in the chewing process. The muscles of chewing includes the masseter, it, it includes the pterygoids, the lateral and medial pterygoids, it includes the temporalis muscle, okay, so it includes the temporalis, and it also does include, um, no, that's it, sorry. Those are primary, the mu major muscles of chewing. To a lesser extent, mastication does get the help of the cheeks and the tongue, but the major muscles of chewing are the pterygoids, the masseter, and the um, temporalis. Now, what cranial nerve innervates those muscles, it is the trigeminal nerve, but only one branch of the trigeminal nerve. It's the mandibular branch. So remember, the trigeminal nerve has three branches. Two, only one of them is motor, and that's the mandibular branch. The other two branches would be your maxillary and your ophthalmic. So what is involved in chewing? Well, it is a reflex. And chewing is primarily unconscious. You don't really, you're not, you don't think about it. But we can mediate chewing by higher conscious output. But most of the time we don't even think about it. Well, it involves a reflex. So the presence of the food particles in the mouth causes a reflex inhibition of the chewing muscles, which ends up dropping the jaw. And really, the only bone that moves during mastication is the mandible. That's the only bone that moves during mastication. So the muscles involved in that are inhibited. 
the lower jaw drops. But that triggers a stretch reflex. So if you stretch a skeletal muscle, as long as you have uh, nervous input, because this will not happen unless you have nervous input to the muscle. If you stretch out a muscle, the muscle spindle is active. That sends the information through the sensory neuron to the integration center, which is going to be in the brain stem here. This is going to be a cranial reflex. Consequence of a stretch reflex, you should remember from Physio 1 and what we've talked about in this trial, so when we talk about reflexes anyway, is we're going to have motor input coming, which is going to cause those muscles to contract. And this continues on into the point where you decide that you want to swallow that particular food. Now, when you process, you get to the point of swallowing or deglutition, that is extremely complicated action. Most people always like, it's not that complicated, but it is extremely complicated. This process of swallowing is considered to be one of the most complicated actions that's carried out by the nervous system. So it has three steps. One, the first one's a voluntary, it's called the buccal phase. Then it's followed by two other steps or phases, the pharyngeal and the esophageal phases. The names come from kind of where you are in the step of swallowing. When the buca has to do with your cheeks. So when the food is in your mouth, they refer to this the buccal phase. Once it hits the pharynx, specifically the oral pharynx, it is called the pharyngeal. Once it hits the esophagus, they call it the esophageal phase. What I want you to know is just kind of think about what you, when you're swallowing, what where do you want the food to go? Where do you not want the food to go? And then it kind of will make sense when we look at the different steps involved. So we're going to look at the first phase, the buccal phase. So the mass of food is in your mouth. It's going to be moved to the back of the oral cavity by the tongue. And that is will initiate what is referred to as the swallowing reflex. This is voluntary. You are in control voluntary control whether or not you want to initiate swallowing. So you're going to be moving it to the back of the throat towards the oropharynx. Once you get back here, it will trigger the swallowing reflex. You have receptors in the back of the throat that are going to be stimulated. So once this bolus of food, or food mass, we're going to call it a bolus, enters the esophagus, or not esophagus, sorry, the pharynx, the oral pharynx, there are going to be a number of things involved. And it looks like, oh, there's so much, so much here. But think about what you want to happen. You do not want that bolus of food to go out through your nose. So you want the soft palate to close over the nasal cavity so it doesn't come out through your nose. You want the lungs to be protected. So you're going to have the epiglottis that's going to be covering or closing over the larynx. Also, simultaneously, your respiratory center, which is in the medulla oblongata, is going to be inhibited. You're not going to breathe. So when you swallow, you don't breathe. You ever think about when, if you're trying to drink a big glass of water without stopping, you have an entire glass of water, you drink, 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 and then we're done, you're like panting because you weren't breathing that whole entire time. So why would you want What's the purpose of having the epiglottis covering the larynx? It's to protect the lungs from injury. One of the big things that we see with people who've got issues in regards, like if you have stroke victims, Alzheimer's patients, elderly patients, they have a higher risk of aspiration pneumonia because this process is very complicated, involves the nervous system. You have a lot of cranial nerves that are involved in this process. If you don't have this epiglottis covering the pharynx, you have a greater incidence of food particles being aspirated in the lungs, which can cause infection. We also, you've got, you're covering up the nasal cavity, you're protecting the lungs, stopping breathing, you're going to, um, you want the sphincter that's up in the upper part of the esophagus to relax 
to allow food to go into the esophagus and you're also going to have muscles that are in the pharynx that are going to contract to help force the food in the esophagus. So you're moving it deeper back into the pharynx during the pharyngeal phase to the opening of the esophagus. You've protected the lungs. You don't want the food coming out through your nose, even though we know there's been instances where we've had things come out through our nose. But, you know, that's something you can think about if that's happened to you. Um, you're forcing the food down towards the opening of the esophagus. The upper esophageal sphincter, sphincter will relax. Now, this is an involuntary phase. This is going to be a part of the swallowing reflex. Once you get into the esophagus, you're at the esophageal phase. The upper part, which you don't have a picture here, but the upper esophageal sphincter is going to contract to prevent it from going back up for, from once it came. Well, the, when that bolus of food enters the esophagus, it's going to stretch the smooth muscle, the muscularis externa that you see in the esophagus. So the trigger for the primary peristaltic wave is the trigger is stretch of the muscularis externa. Remember in smooth muscle, a very important thing that can cause smooth muscle to contract is stretch. It's going to be mediated by that enteric nervous system, specifically the myenteric plexus. So you stretch, it's going to trigger that peristaltic wave, so remember behind the bolus of food, the circular layer of muscle is going to contract. In front of it, it will relax. Remember what happens to the longitudinal layers. The longitudinal layer in front of the bolus of food will contract. Behind it, it relaxes, so we can push food forward. The If that primary peristaltic wave is insufficient, inadequate, to move the food down through the esophagus to the stomach, a second peristaltic wave will be triggered, and hopefully that's enough to move that bolus of food towards the stomach. Again, it just, if it didn't move through, that stretch of it is going to trigger another wave to move it through. Now, simultaneously, you have what we call receptive relaxation. This is all going through the nervous system. These are all reflexes. You have that stretch of the myenteric plexus, stimulates that peristaltic wave. Simultaneously, you're going to be relaxing the lower esophageal sphincter because before you go to the food, you have, there is a sphincter that's going to keep things from entering the stomach. I want to relax it. You also, the very upper part of the stomach, we refer to as the ORED because it's closer to your mouth, ORED or oral cavity. The ORED part, portion of the stomach is going to relax in anticipation of the food. And it's all mediated through the nervous system. Well, once that food hits the stomach, then hopefully we can start breaking it up, mixing it with some digestive juices. But there are some people that have problems with the whole process of swallowing. And a, the term for, a, for difficulty swallowing is called dysphagia. Diffi dis having to do with difficulty, phagia having to do with like eating and golfing. But here it's difficulty swallowing. There are a number of different things that can lead to dysphagia or be a cause of dysphagia. dysphagia. Problems with the cervical spine. Considering the fact that that cervical spine has a lot of nerves involved in the swallowing process. It could be nerve problems. Again, that kind of led it to the cervical spine, but it could be nerve problems. And it not necessarily have to be autonomic nervous system. It could be involved with the enteric nervous system also. There could also be problems with the muscle. Conditions like um, myasthenia gravis um, could have people with that condition have problems swallowing. Um, people have had strokes have problems swallowing because that's going to be have problems with the nerves. Um, there's another condition I'm going to talk about that it is associated with difficulty swallowing and it's called achalasia. So achalasia 
come is derived from a from a Greek word where the this um, root word kalasia or kalasis means relax or loosen. Having the a in front of it, then they have the inability to relax or loosen. Well, that term came from in some people with achalasia, that lower esophageal sphincter doesn't relax. And so you see here, there's kind of like, you see, it's like nothing's getting down through here. And what you see with this esophagus, this is someone's esophagus, it is just getting very, very much enlarged because food is accumulating in there. And it's not kind of, it's having a hard time getting down into the stomach because that lower esophageal sphincter is not relaxing. Now, the in this same individual, they did they did surgery to kind of loosen up that lower esophageal sphincter to make food go down a little bit easier. But this is not a cure all. What you saw with this this post operative fix, the problem or the number of things that are uh, can correlate with this achalasia or more of like a dysmotility problem, we can refer to more of a dysmotility, is it could be result of failure of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax, which I had mentioned, lack of nervous system stimulation to the esophagus, and some of people they've, they've lost ganglion cells of the myenteric plexus. So if you don't have a functioning or intact myenteric plexus, you will not be able to trigger the peristaltic waves. So things that where you lose those wave-like contractions through the esophagus, that could lead to achalasia. Well, so if they took this individual and kind of loosened up that lower esophageal sphincter, what could be effects of that? So it's still going to have probably dysmotility problems. So they're going to always kind of have a little bit of difficulty swallowing, but they have to limit how much they eat at once, how well they chew. And the other issue is if you kind of open up that lower esophageal sphincter, you do have issues where stomach acid may come back up and erode the esophagus. So there are kind of problems that result from the surgery. Now here, we're been to the stomach. So we started with chewing, followed by swallowing, moving all that bolus of food to the stomach. So let's review the anatomy of the stomach. Should be reviewed because I believe you've already done this, but we're going to review the anatomy of the stomach. Food, going to move down the esophagus. Remember we had mentioned that the um, lower esophageal sphincter is going to relax to allow the food to come into this region here. The other name for the lower esophageal sphincter is also referred to as the cardiac sphincter because this region was indicated by number one is referred to as the cardia or the cardiac region because it's close to the heart. That's where they came up with that name. Where you see number two, it's kind of balloon part of the stomach, re referred to as a, the fundus or the fundic region of the stomach. Think of it as kind of a holding type station. Then we're into number three, which is pr pretty much the body of the stomach. The first part up here of the stomach, first two thirds of the body is referred to as your orad portion of the stomach because it's closer to your mouth. Once we start moving down, we're seeing number four, this is the antrum, and that's the animation you saw from that the, when they did that um, endo endoscopy of that individual where you got to see the peristalsis in the gastric antrum. So number four is the antrum. Number five is the pyloric region, and what is indicated by 5B is our pyloric sphincter. So the tone of the pyloric sphincter will determine how much of this, the contents, we're going to just call it contents first, the contents of the stomach will empty into the small intestine. And 
the previous lecture, we did talk about the gastroenteric reflex, and we had talked about the role of how the tone of that pyloric sphincter. So these are kind of just your areas in the stomach. When we talk about digestion and secretion in the stomach, I want you to kind of remember where we are, because I say these particular glands are located in this part of the stomach. So I want you to kind of be oriented with the anatomy of it. So here, in case you missed it, this is what we have for the different parts of the stomach. Now the stomach, one of the big things that the stomach does is it stores food. It's a big storage function. So it will expand. Now if you go back here and see, these are the rugae, the, these mucosal folds that you have in the stomach. They're going to flatten out as the stomach stretches out. Now the storage function, part of it that you get initially from that swallowing reflex, I had mentioned about that receptive relaxation. Now there is a reflex, it is a visceral reflex because the muscle, the effector is smooth muscle. It is initiated by that peristaltic wave that originated in the esophagus. So pretty much the stretch of the muscularis externa in the esophagus triggered peristalsis, which triggered this vasovagal reflex that caused receptive relaxation. So they call it vagal because the vagus nerve is involved in this. So the orad part of the stomach will relax to serve more of a storage function. But also a big part of the stomach is to t start to break up the food particles even more and increase the surface area of the food particles so digestive enzymes can work on it. So here, my picture of kind of process of, of the mixing type movements that you see in the stomach, that is initiated by, um, we have, well, I shouldn't say initiated, we have slow waves. Remember we talked about slow waves. Slow waves do not trigger contractions. You have to be able to reach threshold in order to have the spike potential. But the slow waves where you have that fluctuation of the membrane potential, the frequency of the slow waves will ultimately determine the overall max frequency of con contractions that you get. Now in the stomach, you have the, once you reach threshold and you generate spike potential, we're going to have the contractions kind of moving from up here down towards the, the pyloric sphincter. And depending on the tone of the pyloric sphincter determines how much of this, and when we mix the secretions from the stomach with the food, it becomes what we call chyme. It's like an oatmeal-like paste. So the amount of chyme that enters the duodenum is determined by the, the pyloric tone. So a little bit will get through, but not a lot. So as the waves move down, the contractions move down, if that pyloric sphincter is constricted, a lot of that chyme will start moving back up, and that's what they refer to as retropulsion. So retropulsion is used in a number of different um, terms. It's used in not just GI physiology, but in GI physiology, retropulsion refers to what you see, those, those mixing movements that are associated with the stomach. So these mixing movements, what they're doing is just going down and back and down and back. What that's doing is it's mixing the food with gastric secretions like hydrochloric acid and pepsin, and some other things that are going to kind of increase the surface area of the food particles. You'll have a little bit of digestion, and we'll talk about that when we discuss secretions and digestion. But most of, or I should say, the only thing that will, you'll start to digest in the stomach is protein. So, but it won't be complete in the stomach. So we're just kind of breaking the food particles up even more. Now, gastric contractions 
can be modulated or affected by the autonomic nervous system. But one of the biggest things that will affect gastric uh, contractions will be the enteric nervous system. So the myenteric plexus will be very important in the motility and mixing movements that you see in the stomach. And what the trigger for the myenteric plexus to tell the muscle in the stomach to contract will be what's locally going on. You have stretch of the stomach. You have various substances in the stomach. That is going to be the main thing involved in these mixing movements, but the ANS can also affect it. So, which division of the autonomic nervous system will increase it? Which will decrease it? I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it. So the division that increases it is the parasympathetic nervous system. Decreases it would be your sympathetic. Now here's something that we talked about last lecture is this migrating motor complex. The reason why I put it in this lecture because it does originate within the stomach. So remember, I had mentioned that these are these waves of contractions that will originate in the stomach, but it goes down into the intestines and it happens in the interdigestive state or between meals. The migrating motor complex is a very distinct pattern of electrical me me electromechanical activity that's in your G GI tract that happens during meals and it does originate in the stomach and it moves down to the intestines. So we said it allows you to kind of move un in or undigestible material through the GI tract. It also um, helps to kind of keep bacteria out, keep bacteria away from the colon, or um, from the colon, from getting back to the ileum. So, like, move it out, keep moving it through. Remember, we talked about there's a hormone that's considered to be involved. Nervous system will be involved, but the hormone that was involved was motilin. What I'm going to pose to you, and it's your job to ask me in lecture, understanding a little bit about this migrating motor complex. Does it have therapeutic implications? Does it have any social implications? So think about it and you can pose that question to me during lecture. Now this emptying of the stomach will be determined by a number of different things. So we said definitely how constricted that pyloric sphincter is will control the emptying. So what can control the tone of the pyloric sphincter? You have factors associated with the stomach, referred to as gastric factors. And then you have factors associated with the duodenum, which are considered to be more important. So let's do the gastric factors. The more you have in your stomach, the higher the volume, the contents of your stomach, that will increase the rate of gastric emptying. So think of it as you don't want your stomach to explode. So you got a lot in there, let's kind of move it out. It's going to be, what's going to be involved is just local reflexes uh, mediated by the myenteric nervous system. So you'll have to stretch. There's also a hormone made in the antrum called gastrin. And gastrin also has been considered to help to increase the emptying of the stomach. The actual way or significance of that, I'm unsure. So I probably will not ask you about that one. The one I probably ask, want you to remember is just think about more volume in the stomach. It's going to speed up stomach emptying. Now the enterogastric reflex is kind of, we talk about the gastroenteric reflex. We're going to talk about the enterogastric reflex. So entero means something has happened in the intestine. No, actually, did we talk about the gastroenteric or was it enterogastric? It was the enterogastric. So dis disregard Dr. Case's moment of uh, her senile moment. So enterogastric reflex. Entero means something happened in the intestine cause and effect in the stomach. 
So we had seen a little video that kind of talked about this reflex. So we have the duodenum fills up with the chyme from the stomach. It's going to stimulate sensory receptors like stretch receptors. But you also have chemoreceptors in there. You have osmoreceptors. You have a number of different sensory receptors that will be stimulated. Sensory information is sent up the, the brainstem, and then motor input moves down through the it's actually through the vagus. It's going to go through the vagus. Sensory is up and down, and it, what it does, it's going to start to inhibit gastric peristalsis, and it's going to cause the pyloric sphincter to constrict a little bit more because you want to slow the rate of stomach emptying. So, a cholecystokinin, we had mentioned in the last lecture, is also involved. You have the cells in the duodenum that make a hormone called cholecystokinin, and it does help to slow down gastric emptying. And remember cholecystokinin, one of the things that triggered that was acidic chyme and fatty chyme. What else do you remember does cholecystokinin do besides slowing gastric emptying? Remember what its effects on the gallbladder and the sphincter of Odi. So just, I'm going to let you just try to remember that. Now the duodenal factors, which do link to what we just talked about here, this enterogastric reflex, these duodenal factors are more important. And it has to do with the nervous system. So we mentioned about the hormonal, the nervous system, but what I didn't kind of elaborate was what type of stimulation in the duodenum will slow the rate of gastric emptying. We had, I would mentioned before about the acidity of the chyme. If it's very acidic, you definitely want to slow the rate of gastric emptying because you could damage the duodenal wall because of the acid. And also you want to have time to be able to neutralize it so enzymes can work well for digestion. And we'll be talking about later how we start neutralizing it. Fat in the chyme, particularly fatty chyme, will also slow the rate of gastric emptying as well as degradation products, protein, because protein degradation does begin in the stomach. So the way you can think about this, these two here, is if you have a meal that's pretty good in a little bit more fat content, a little more protein in it, you tend to feel fuller longer because it's going to slow the amount of stomach emptying. Irritation, though, will also, too, if you've got a lot of irritation, and you can kind of correspond irritation also with acidity. Any type of irritant can slow the rate of gastric emptying too. But we're going to show you what it's going to do to the intestine a little bit later. So it will do some things in the small intestine. So the, the duodenal factors are have to do with um, presence of certain things in that duodenum that you cause effects with the uh, stomach motility and the rate of emptying and it's being through the nervous system but it's also well from or as well as from the hormone cholecystokinin which is made in the duodenum. So we're going to stop here for the first part. Beginning of lecture I'm going to do a review with you to kind of see if you remember some major uh, concepts associated with the first part of the lecture. We'll, all, we'll continue on, and then we're also going to be do, discussing the case study of chiropractic and its role in GI physiology.